Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's review is 2014's Cthulhu Britannica London for Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition by Cubicle 7. Originally, Cthulhu Britannica London was conceived and funded by a Kickstarter, of which I was a backer, but was later available for general purchase. The first thing that strikes you is the quality here. The box set is absolute top-notch. The box itself is made of a smooth, thick matte cardboard and is so full it doesn't even close completely. The attention to detail is superb, with even the interiors of the box being resplendent with a map of London. It contains three glossy softback books, the 184 page An Investigator's Guide to London, the 126 page A Keeper's Guide to London and the 96 page Adventures in Mythos London. Also, as part of the set, we have a few different maps and some Grade A handouts for the adventures contained within. OK, first up is an investigator's guide to London. The first chapter is unsurprisingly called Welcome to London. In this chapter, it begins with the Great War which details the effect that it had upon Britain and its people. It then moves on to how the war changed London, including an interesting section on Baritsu, a martial art that was taught in the early 20th century there. Following that, the narrative shifts to the British Empire and the wide-ranging impact it had upon the world, with some great information on the British Empire exhibition of 1924 and how it could easily explain the presence of anything mythos-based in London. Chapter 2 is entitled A Decade of Growing Tension. This details the various strikes that happened in the 1920s and the rise of fascism. We also get information on the growing wave of immigration and the treatment received by people of different nationalities, including the Irish, which triggered the emergence of the IRA. Chapter 3 details the 1920s year by year and features such highlights as the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb, the formation of the BBC and the birth of the current Queen, Queen Elizabeth II. Chapter 4 is Getting to London. This details the various methods of travel that were available at the time and what visitors would expect coming into the country. It then goes on to discuss the weather and includes details on the most important characteristics of 1920s London, the fog. It goes on to discuss staying in London from high quality hotels right down to boarding houses, including a curious tradition at the Savoy where a wooden cat called Caspar will be seated with a table of 13 diners to prevent bad luck. The next chapter details how to get around London, be that via cars, taxis, trams or the famous London Underground and includes some information on abandoned underground stations. Chapter 6 is called The People of London. Here we have information on the class system, including the correct terms to use when speaking to the various levels of nobility. Following that, we have a section on women of London in the 1920s and how the Great War affected them and the rise of the suffrage movement and the appearance in society of the bright young things. Moving on, it goes on to detail investigator classes with some very London feeling ones like the aristocrat, the British bulldog and some good information on spiritualists including how to summon a spirit guide. We also have a list of notable people of London which includes the likes of Agatha Christie, Winston Churchill and King George V. The next chapter is called Shopping in London. This goes on to describe the various shopping services available and includes information on notable shops such as Fortnum and Mason and Harrods. It has a nice section on how to conduct an auction in game and then goes on to list the various services and prices available in Harrods at the time and is delivered in the style of a shop assistant. Technology communication and the news is next up with details on the various methods of the time as well as information of the many newspapers of the era. Chapter 8 is called Entertainment in London. Here we have information on the various sports and teams of the time as well as the lowdown on the theatres and cinemas of the 20s like Drury Lane and the Lord Chamberlain's office. Following that, we have knowledge on the various gentlemen's clubs of the day, like the Carlton Club and the Athenaeum. We then cover the nightlife of London. This includes all the top nightclubs of the time, like the 43 Club and the Hambone Club, as well as notable pubs like the York Minster and Prospect of Whitby. The London season is covered next. This is the list of events that are highlight of the social calendar, like the Trooping of the Colour and the Proms, amongst others. The following chapter is Law and Order. This chapter covers the London Police Force and gives a handy guide to the various ranks. Scotland Yard is covered including the various departments like the CID and the Flying Squad. We have information on police corruption at the time and also the City of London Police are a separate entity to the Metropolitan Force. We have a brief discussion on the English legal system and on crime in London. The final and larger chapter is the London Guide. 
This covers the physical zones of London and gives details on the various boroughs and the things and places of interest in them. Highlights of this chapter are the Tower of London, Westminster Abbey, the British Museum, the British Library and the Docklands. We have a section on the University of London which gives details on some of the famous luminaries and an interesting part on the various hospitals and asylums in London, including what psychiatric care was like back then. The book finishes with a section on the graveyards and sewers of London. OK, on to book two. Book two is entitled A Keeper's Guide to London. The first part of the book is a short story called Miss Fowler Commands, which is not bad and serves well to set the mood for the rest of the book. The first chapter is called Bringing Mythos London to Life. This sets the scene by discussing London's past and discusses the various ways in which common themes present throughout the city seek to tie the mythos into day-to-day -day life by detailing some odd happenings that have happened and how they are linked to the greater threat. It then goes on to detail the different mythos creatures and how investigators might encounter them. All good moody stuff so far. It then goes on to discuss the powerful mythos deities and how they can be represented around the city, even allegorically. For example, Shubna Gurath could be revealed through fertility symbolism like women feeding babies or pregnant women needing assistance. The next chapter is called The Keeper's History of London. This goes on to delve into the deeper history of London right back from when the Romans conquered Britain, through Queen Boudicca sacking the city and the Viking invasion, to William the Conqueror, the Tudors, the Stuarts and the Civil War, and the restoration of the monarchy right the way to Victorian London and the early 20th century. We then have a very interesting mythos timeline, which ties some of the historical events in with mythos events. Following that, it details some early notable historical figures of London, like William Blake, Alastair Crowley and Dr John Dee. We then have unusual and fourteen events in London year by year. This details odd circumstances throughout the ages. Next up is unusual locations. This details all the usual places that investigators end up, like sewers, catacombs and the like. It then goes on to detail interesting places around London, like Crystal Palace and the Imperial War Museum, but also some of the strange places like Jezreel's Tower, the Masonic Court and the Necropolis Railway. Following this is the People of London. This goes on to discuss occult organisations operating in 1920s London, including more famous ones like the Argenta Mastrum, the Hellfire Club and the Hematic Order of the Golden Dawn, as well as less known ones like the Blind Man of St Martin's, which is a collective of postmen that decipher cryptic mail addresses, and the Kindred of Kibbo Kif that are a youth organisation based around revisiting and reintroducing old ways into new civilization. We then have a list of potential allies and associates. These are a list of interesting NPC characters who could help or hinder investigators. These are excellently illustrated, described and statted out. It then goes on to give an example of a club from London, the Daedalus Club, the purpose serving as a way to justifiably introduce investigators being gathered together and introducing scenarios. The club members, resources and activities are all detailed excellently. The following chapter is Mythos Threats. This presents some Mythos Threats that are ready to use. It features the likes of Boudicca's army, a group of militant women who, unbeknownst to them, are being empowered by the magical spear of the Iceni Queen herself. The Brothers of the Dragon, who are a group that seeks to give the Chthonians dominion over London. The Ghouls of London, which details the various tribes that dwell beneath. And the Greater Service, who seek to influence the great and powerful by methods of insinuation and intimation. Which is led by a 390 year old butler, who has such wonderful skills as Anticipate Desire, Raise Eyebrow and The Done Thing. It then goes on to describe the lesser powers of London that have seen their influence dwindle over time, like Hearn the Hunter and Temesis, the goddess of the Thames. The final part of this chapter goes on to detail a group, the Society of London for the Exploration and Development of the Esoteric Sciences, who seek to serve as antagonists or who could potentially sponsor investigators. The society was formed by Henry Yeowood, who after reading a copy of Liber of Honus, seeks to disseminate spells down to their base level by removing all occult reference, of which he has had some success. He has a fairly large group of scientists that conduct experiments with varying degrees of success and failure. They have managed to open a gate that they can't close to the upper carboniferous period that giant centipedes have come through. Their solution to this was to brick it up, for example. We also have a collection of scenario seeds that the society could provide, including a horrific half-deep one half-pig hybrid. Truly the stuff of nightmares. The final chapter is called Mythos, Spells and Tomes. This goes on to describe the likes of the books of Dr. D and the AOS cards, and the spells that lie within. The appendix details the 6th edition stats for the luminaries contained throughout the book. OK, on to Book 3. Book 3 is entitled Adventures in Mythos London. There will be spoilers from this point on, so stop here if you want to play this. 
This book contains three scenarios to give players a taste of what London has to offer. Scenario number one, Terror on the Thames, revolves around the disciples of the Scarlet Palm, a culty Golnak, on the rise. The investigators end up being invited to a party on a restored Mississippi steamboat, the Louisiana Lady, by Thaddeus Grant, an American millionaire and Anglophile. Grant is attempting to rise up the echelons of British society, so has arranged a party and cruise to mix with the right people. Unbeknownst to him, the leader of the cult, William Cunliffe, has other plans. He has come across a fosterling of Egolnach, Felicia Ingram. Cunliffe intends to make a grand sacrifice to Egolnach by sacrificing everybody on board the boat in order to accelerate Felicia's transformation. The scenario itself is in three acts. Act 1 begins with the investigators boarding the Louisiana Lady and ends with them being drugged and passing out. Act 2 begins with the investigators waking up and having to investigate the still fog shrouded silent river boat to find out what is happening and ends with them abandoning it as it explodes. Act 3 ends on Dead Man's Island where they discover the cult has set up a debauched temple in an abandoned cargo barge where they have a showdown with the cult and the transformed Felicia. The second scenario is called Those Poor Souls Who Dwell in Light. This revolves around a debauched holy man, Reverend Lee, who has come across a powerful magical item, the Crystallum, which has allowed him to use and abuse his flock by controlling their minds. The investigators are hired by a Lionel Gullen who wants them to investigate the death of his niece, Alice Dorr. Continues with the investigators following various leads until they finally confront Lee himself, who has some interesting tricks up his sleeve. The scenario climaxes with a confrontation with Lee as he attempts to open a gateway to what he perceives as heaven, and the investigators may even have to side with an elder thing to succeed. This scenario has a definite body horror overtones, as well as the uncomfortable notion that the Reverend Lee has been raping the women of his parish. The final scenario, The Non-Euclidean Gate, centres around the recent discovery of seven lost pages of the works of Dr John Dee. The investigators are hired by a bookseller, Leander Rapture Grieve. Grieve was recently contacted by the owner of the pages, the headmistress of the Mortlake School for Girls, to verify their authenticity. Since then they have been stolen, and Grieve wants the investigators to retrieve them. The investigators will need to make inquiries with the headmistress, Wilhelmina Havisham, at the school, which they discover used to be Dr John Dee's house. The investigators are led to the home of another book dealer, Randolph Kipps, who they discover has recently been murdered. They are then contacted by agents representing the Golden Dawn, who offer more than Grieve is offering to recover the documents, and the investigators manage to track down another book dealer, Atticus Stamp, who is trying to enact Dee's ritual to open the gateway to Avalon, where he suspects Dee himself is alive and well. The scenario climaxes with the investigators having to make the choice to stop the ritual or observe the outcome. The aftermath, if they live, is deciding what to do with the pages. In conclusion, I was blown away by this set. There's very little here that doesn't impress. The writing is thorough and engaging throughout, the artwork is excellent, and the general quality of the books themselves feels robust and well made. There have been other attempts at bringing London into the Mythos fold, Games Workshop's Green and Pleasant Land, and Chaosium the London Guidebook for example, but simply put, neither of these hold a candle to Cthulhu Botanical London in terms of content or presentation. This set is a must-have for anyone wanting to run scenarios in the old smoke, and there's enough here to keep keepers and players happy for a long time. So for the score. There are odd typos and the odd piece of mismatched art, but it would be incredibly unfair to nitpick in that manner on such a fantastic product. I give Cthulhu Britannica London an easy 10 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Also, don't forget to check out my other reviews. Put out.